All right, ladies and gentlemen, our speaker tonight, uh, and we are very honored and lucky to have her, is Molly Wakeman, eminent ethnographer, joining us all the way from Ohio, staying up late just for us. She's been a friend of Sabbath for a long time, and she used to be based out here in California, and she was a regular attendee at uh, HBO Functions. She is an eminent photographer. She has now her own column in Astronomy Magazine, where she reviews astronomical gear, well earned. She's going to lecture us tonight about, about what are star parties? Why would you want to go to one? What happens to star parties? She uh, is more qualified than pretty much anyone else to tell us why. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, whether you're here in person at Carmichael or joining us via Zoom, uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Molly, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me back. Uh, it's uh, it's been fun to come uh, speak to the club. I think I think I've attended have I attended one in person meeting. I can't remember. I used to live in California. I was there there for uh, for two years, um, and then I moved back to Ohio. And yeah, I was up at Blue Canyon relatively often with that red and white trailer that you might remember. <laughs> I've got a picture of it in here. Um, and uh, yeah, back out in Ohio, miss California for sure. But uh, one place to get some clear skies and dry air and dark skies out of Ohio is to go to star parties. So uh, I, I take take my time. A lot of my vacation time is spent going to star parties because they're just uh, really fun things to go do. Uh, yeah. So what is a star party for the totally uninitiated? It's uh, I usually describe it as like a convention, like an outdoor convention for amateur astronomers. And it gets it really kind of has that convention atmosphere of just uh, people who are obsessed with the same thing you're obsessed with, except we're outside instead of in a convention center. And uh, they can be two or three days or as long as eight days and just a whole bunch of fun crammed into a small period of time. And it's almost kind of like summer camp for grownups, <laughs> I think is another way to describe it. So what kinds of things happen at star parties? So there's all night observing and imaging, and there's usually very strict lighting restrictions to help uh, preserve your night vision to the greatest extent possible so you can enjoy those dark skies and so that imagers can get great pictures. In the daytime, there's lots of stuff going on as well. Image processing workshops. Uh, some, some star parties like Texas Star Party have their own observing programs. So there'll be a, a presentation about the observing programs scientific talks at some of these. Uh, at the Green Bank Star Quest, there's some phenomenal scientific talks uh, about radio astronomy. And a lot of times also astrophotography talks and workshops as well with um, uh, sometimes with some pretty preeminent uh, astrophotographers like uh, John Talbot is a regular at uh, I think Texas Star Party and Okie Techs for doing workshops. You get to meet new people, see old friends, meet people you've only seen online, which is fun, and uh, and also rub elbows with some more well-known astronomers. Uh, there's some, uh, there's a couple of, of guys who I see a lot on YouTube, uh, Trevor Jones and Will Young, who I get to see at these star parties. Um, I've not seen Adam Block at a star party, but uh, John Talbot and um, uh, gosh, uh, all kinds of people. Uh, Pranvera Hyseni I've seen at a couple star parties. Um, so it's, it's uh, yeah. Get to see some of the the famous astronomy people sometimes <laughs> and these are also usually in remote outdoor locations that have a lot of cool outdoor stuff to do so hiking birding there, there's a big crossover of astronomers amateur astronomers who are into birding and also amateur astronomers who are into ham radio the the amateur astronomers who are the checklisters tend to be also birders and the amateur astronomers who are the gear junkies tend to also be ham radio operators. There's kind of this, this crossover. And Texas Star Party has a ham radio meetup and a whole ham radio shack and stuff. Or you can just uh, consume some beverages and relax in the shade. It's also fun, especially when you've been up all night. And yeah, like I said, kind of like growing up summer camp. So what are some reasons, reasons that you should consider going to a star party? First of all, Dark skies, see the Milky Way like you've never seen it. Blue Canyon is 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 good, but you can get much darker than Blue Canyon by going to place. Uh, actually, living out on the West Coast, you guys are lucky because there's so many dark sky places within reach. Uh, and yeah, just see very very nice dark skies. 
get to make new friends. Texas Star Party, one of the years I went, there was a group of Australians who had come out and they were kind of just doing like a US tour. We're kind of into astronomy, came to the Star Party and just like had a raucous party the whole week. <laughs> they were just, they were a blast. Sometimes you get to look through very large telescopes. This is a Star Party here in Ohio that has a 36 inch Newtonian on this uh, crazy kind of equatorial mount that you can go look through, which is really cool. See weird people, see people's weird contraptions. No, well, okay, maybe weird people's weird contraptions, but see people's weird contraptions. This is one that I spotted at Texas Star Party. He took a, a car seat and um, it, it's it's this scissor uh, kind of lift thing that he's, he can put either a telescope or a pair of binoculars on and he can set them exactly in front of his face and then just lean back and observe in total comfort and the whole thing spins around and it's uh it's pretty ingenious just built out of spare parts from around his garage i'm sure attend lots of cool talks uh this is one where he was showing us how meteorites are made with some homemade chemistry oh. win fabulous prizes the texas star party is famous for its uh, great texas giveaway and depending on the star party, you can get some pretty nice donations from people and from vendors. Uh, Texas Star Party usually has a telescope to give away and some very nice eyepieces. And some of the larger star parties also have some really nice stuff. And some of the smaller star parties occasionally get some nice stuff as well. So where and when are these star parties? There's a complete list that Sky and Telescope maintains on their website that has links to all of uh, all the information pages for these star parties, but I've highlighted some here. The ones in italics are ones that are within about 10 hours of Sacramento, and the ones in bold are ones that I've been to. And they occur all throughout the year, largely in the summertime, but in some southern locales and some warmer locales, you can go in the wintertime. So the winter star party in the Florida Keys, which is about as far as I think as you can get from Sacramento uh, in February, uh, Death Valley Star Party in January and October. Uh, other star parties throughout the spring all over the country. Texas Star Party is usually in May. And Texas Star Party is kind of the premier star party. There's usually about 400 people in attendance. And people come from all over the country and, and also sometimes from overseas to come to the star party. Um, I will be going to Cherry Springs in June. So uh, that's an, uh, an unexpectedly dark part of Pennsylvania. So I'll be, I'll be driving out there from here. When I go to Albuquerque, I'll probably hit up Rocky Mountain Star Stair. One of my close friends will be living in, in Colorado. So we'll probably just rendezvous there, which will be nice. Here's some more throughout the rest of the summer. Um, Grand Canyon Star Party. It's a, it's a little more than 10 hours away, but uh, definitely one of the, um, a, a cool West Coast Star Party to go to. They, they, one of the nights there is a, is a public night as well. So if you're into doing some outreach, then that's a good opportunity to do outreach to the public under very dark skies. There's a couple in Canada, Washington. Um, I've not been to Almost Heaven, even though it's in uh, West Virginia, which is only about four hours from me. The timing just hasn't worked out. Um, Oregon Star Party is one that's within reach of Sacramento. And then, of course, there's Golden State Star Party. Um, and then moving on into the fall, the Idaho Star Party in September, that's within reach of y'all. Um, and yeah, once, uh, you know, I found it odd that there seems to be more star parties on the eastern half of the country than the western half of the country, even though the western half is where all the dark skies are. Uh, but it could just be a population density thing. So uh, to incentivize you to consider going to star parties, I'm going to tell some stories about some fun times I've had at several of these star parties. So I mentioned the Texas Star Party. It's a 20 hour drive from Dayton, Ohio. I usually take about two and a half days to make that drive. I've gone three years. It's in Fort Davis, Texas. So here's the dark sky map. Um, it's kind of hard to see the state lines, but uh, here's the edge of Texas and New Mexico. Um, here's Dallas, Fort Worth and Houston, San Antonio. And it's way over here in the southwest corner, about an hour north of Big Bend National Park, uh, out in what you can see is almost a Bortle One sky. They get some light from the oil fields and stuff, but it's quite dark out there. Uh, I went my the first year I flew my sister all the way out from Washington to come with me. 
out there and I stuffed my Ford Escape absolutely full of equipment and started the drive out there. Sometimes you hit some weather. This is in in uh, May. I went the southern route the first time through um, uh, Missouri and I say no, the, the northern route the first time through Missouri, which had a lot more weather than when I started taking the southern route through Arkansas later on. So here's a, a lovely shelf cloud <laughs> from some tornadoes that were uh, that ended up forming south of us. Uh, this is from uh, Abilene, Texas, where we had an incredible thunderstorm one of the nights I was there. And there was a group of storm chasers that were staying at the hotel. And I was also out there taking pictures with my DSLR. And I thought I was with them, but I wasn't. <laughs> I'm just another sky nerd that's not a storm chaser. So my first year I went out there, I brought my, uh, what I, most of, most of what I had at the time, which was this 11 inch Schmidt Castagrain on a CGE Pro. There's a long story as to how I ended up with this kit uh, about two years into my astrophotography career. Actually, I got this, this, um, the 11 inch telescope on a Celestron CGE mount six months into doing astrophotography when my uh, very generous uncle gave me his complete rig when he went and bought a new rig. My first telescope was this eight inch slush on Schmidt Castigram. I borrowed a slush on AVX and a club member in my club here had given me this really nice Borg refractor. I think somebody's uh, mic is hot. Um, check your mic, please. Uh, yeah, so in 2018, I downsized a little bit, but still brought out the the big boy, uh, the C11 and CG Pro. Somebody's mic. Molly, Molly, unmute yourself, Molly. Molly, unmute yourself, please. Yeah, it it kept auto muting me, so yeah. I don't know what happened there. Um, okay. Okay, sounds like the person letter shut off their mic. Okay, great. Cool. Okay, so I ran the big giant C11 next to its little brother, the Borg on the AVX here, kind of a, a, a wannabe telescope rig, although I think I got better pictures out of the Borg that week uh, due to some mount problems. 2019, I downsized even more, kind of go the opposite direction of a lot of astrophotographers, started big through... Uh, through happenstance and then moved a little bit smaller. Same uncle who gave me the C11 sold me this uh, Takahashi FSQ 106, which I did not imagine I would own a Takahashi nearly this early into my astrophotography career. It's if you're, for the unfamiliar, Takahashi is basically the Ferrari of the astronomy community. They make incredible telescopes. And yes, it is every bit as good as people say it is. I get incredible stars on there. I uh, I acquired a minion in my time at the uh, here in Ohio. Um, she's started out as a high, she was a high school senior I think when she when I met her in the club, and she was kind of wanting to get into astrophotography. I helped her learn how to do it, helped her pick out some other equipment, and uh, she's now earning her PhD in astrophysics at Ohio State, which uh, I couldn't be more proud. <laughs> uh, very exciting. This is uh, Michaela. And in 2019, I got to bring my parents out to the Texas Star Party. I convinced them to fly down. And they don't know anything about astronomy besides what I've told them and they've tried to understand. Uh, but I showed them how to use uh, my Celestron 8-inch on the next star mount. This was my first telescope. It was, a, it was a gift. And I showed them how to use it. I gave them the Texas Star Party observing list, kind of the... the um, the main list for that year, not the challenging one, but the kind of easier one. And they went to town. They uh, were slewing to these the targets and uh, pointing out to each other like, oh, I think I see it there. You know, I taught them how to use averted vision. And it was really fun to share the hobby with my parents for, for a week. And they'll never come out again, but <laughs> they had a good time. <laughs> Here's the overhead view of the Texas Star Party. This is the upper field. This is where the serious astronomers uh, set up and it's very densely populated and um, they generally ask photographers avoid being up here because you'll get yelled at by the visual observers for having any kind of extra lights or an unshielded not right enough not dim enough computer screen uh, the middle field down here is a little more sparsely populated by 
the more casual types. And then the lower field, which you can't quite see in the picture here, is where a lot of the astrophotographers set up. We can spread out a lot and then nobody complains about the light from our computer screens. Uh, they've got a large air conditioned uh, lecture hall. And so all the lectures for the week are there, all the presentations. This is where the prize giveaways happen. And it's just kind of a nice place to hang out during the day when it gets hot. About 15 minutes away from the Texas Star Party is the McDonald Observatory, which has some incredible historical telescopes, as well as some incredible currently active research telescopes. And you can go get a tour of it while you're at the Texas Star Party. And uh, so this is the other brought not only my parents, um, but actually I convinced my aunt and uncle to come. This is the astronomy uncle here. And uh, we, uh, yeah, so we went up toward the McDonald Observatory. Uh, one of the telescopes there, let's see, I think this is video, is the 107 inch uh, J. Harlan Smith uh, Cassegrain refract, uh, reflector. And uh, they do actually still use this for uh, for research. That's a giant spectrometer on the back there. And they let people in the audience run the little control box to slew the telescope and they move the dome around. It's just really cool. And uh, one of the areas that uh, I got lucky enough to get to hold the stick and, and uh, run the control and it was, it was very cool. One of the uh, really amazing research telescopes they have there is the Hobby Eberly telescope, which um, this uh, this is the mirror. It's um, uh, 30 feet across and up above, we can't quite see is where the camera assembly is. Although um, at this time they're configuring it to be a, an enormous spectrometer. And it's it's turning here on like air cushions. It just, these air cushions inflate and then it has very low friction with these air cushions and the whole thing just turns. And it can't, it cannot point in altitude, but it can turn and so they kind of have these annuli of observing windows. So they have a very interesting system of prioritizing uh, who, uh, what targets are seen that night because of their very weird uh, field of view. But uh, yeah, incredible research telescope that is just a, really a marvel to look at and figure out how they built. They do feature pretty well at the Texas Star Party. There's uh, uh, they've got a kitchen. They they've got staff that staff it, and you get a lot of food, and you get really hungry staying up all night all week. So, uh, it's good to good to be well fed. They do have bunk houses at the Texas Star Party. So if you don't have a trailer and you don't want a tent camp, I don't recommend tent camping at Star Parties because you when you try to sleep in during the day, it can get kind of toasty. Uh, but you can stay in one of the bunk houses, which is much cooler. And uh, yeah, then you don't have to bring your trailer down. Uh, and yeah, just some kind of general fun. This is Robert Reeves, the preeminent lunar astrophotographer. I don't remember who this is. They're doing a silly skit. It's a great time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you just get to sit and just absorb how incredible the Milky Way is. Uh, you know, bring bring a chair that you can lean back in and just stare at it for some period of the night because it's it's just incredible. Here's a view overlooking the upper field. And then here's a really neat mosaic of one minute exposures, uh, one minute tracked exposures I took on my DSLR that I'm quite pleased with how that came out. And yeah, Milky Way is incredible to see out there. A star party a little closer to me and an example of, of a smaller star party is the Hidden Hollow star party. So it's about a two hour drive for me from here. So a little easier to get to. It's just over a, a three day weekend. Um, and it's not in the darkest spot in Ohio. It's in kind of this bordel uh, four and a half, four, four and a half ish zone, but it is a little bit darker than my local dark sky site. And it's just a fun group of people to go hang out with. But this is, they have a, the camp that they have it at has this enormous, telescope beside of this giant dome and this is that 36 inch that I mentioned earlier it's called big blue and so I said it's a Newtonian the eyepiece is up here at the top so club members that train to use the observatory train to use this scissor lift and they drive it around to where the eyepiece will be and then they lift you up to the eyepiece on the scissor lift so you can take about three people at a time up to see the eyepiece but 
I'll tell you what, looking through a, a kind of globular cluster through this 36 inch is an experience. It it's you can resolve hundreds of stars. It's beautiful. This is a very small star party. This is the observing field, as it were. Uh, a couple more people set up than I took this picture with. But uh, yeah, people bring out their Dobsonians, wander around, look through people's telescopes. I set up on, there's a hill here that I go set up on top of um, to do my imaging and not get people's flashlights in my camera. Uh, but then I, after the imaging starts, I go wander about and look through other people's Dobsonians, which is what I do at every star party. Uh, another lecture hall, cafeteria area uh, to go hang out in. Uh, one year, so the first year I went out, first or first second year, I don't take a lot of pictures of myself at this one, um, but out the C11 and the CGE Pro, but we only had like one clear night. So um, I and actually, yeah, th this year, the, the 2017 year, my mount like was having all kinds of trouble. It didn't run very well. So I ended up borrowing an entire rig from the astronomy club there, which was very nice of them to let me borrow. And so in subsequent years, I downsized more and more because it's usually only one clear night at the star party to just bringing my my Celestron AVX and broken on 135 millimeter camera lens and just a very kind of simple setup to take advantage of the dark skies, but not have a lot of equipment to haul out there. They had some bunk houses that were nice to stay in or some cabins rather. Lots of fun scientific talks. And yeah, a little tiny weekend star party. So those can be really fun to go to as well. And it's just a really fun crew of people uh, that I got to see each year. One year I went to the Green Bank Star Quest. So this is at the Green Bank Radio Astronomy Observatory out in Green Bank, West Virginia. It's about a six hour drive for me from here. And it's out in that very dark part of West Virginia where there's not a lot of people living in the radio quiet zone. And uh, some very nice, lovely dark skies out there. Really kind of a dark sky retreat for anybody who lives on the eastern half of the country, really on the, and on the east coast especially. Again, packed up my car, stuffed it full. I've gotten very good at Tetrising my trunk. Went out with my minion, Michaela. And uh, there in the background is the Green Bank uh, radio telescope, the 300 foot radio dish as seen in contact and uh as uh you might be familiar with just from the fact that it's amazing and huge and does a ton of radio astronomy science for us and yeah you're you literally are set up in the field really in the kind of the shadow of the of the biggest telescope the green bank telescope there it's relatively small and uh, a lot of people you, you can't bring trailers to this one um except for uh, people who are um uh, disabled so a lot of people tent camping or staying in the bunkhouse the the interesting thing about this star party is that they really even though they know they're not going to get a lot of radio observations that weekend because of just general emf emissions from everybody's electronics they ask us to turn off wi-fi and things like that i pretty much can't go to the star party anymore with the amount of automation that i have because half my devices give off wi-fi that i can't turn off <laughs> so i went there that one year it was fun I brought my C11 and the CGE Pro. I think we had one and a half clear nights there because it is uh, a little more cloudy there than the western half of the country. Um, but uh, nice dark skies, did some visual observing as well. Another picture with the Green Bank telescope in the background. They have a really nice science center out there and a really great interpretive center about radio astronomy. That's uh, fun, even for people who are really into astronomy and think they know lots of things, lots of other things to, to learn about, about radio. Uh, on the topic of EMF, uh, that telescope is extremely sensitive in order to detect signals from galaxies billions of light years away, right? So the, uh, the computer lab and the control room are both inside of Faraday cages. They have special Faraday cage windows as well. And so you go through this double double vault door thing made of metal uh, to keep all of the EMF signals. Because uh, EMF is not just from Wi-Fi, but anything that runs uh, electrical power kind of uh, it gives off um, uh, sort of like leftover electric fields. And it can, the Green Bank Telescope can detect a malfunctioning toothbrush 20 miles away. <laughs> so they got to keep as much signal down as possible. Uh, this 
is a microwave, the kind where you turn the knob and then close the door so that uh, you can keep all the microwave radiation even more contained than the microwave does on its own. It's uh, it's very cool the amount of length they have to go to to keep that area radio quiet. They actually have a van chock full of antennas that they'll drive around when they're seeing a noise signal on the telescope to go find somebody who has a powerful microwave or bought a, a too powerful uh, Wi-Fi router or has a malfunctioning electric dog collar and they'll offer to replace it with either a, a non-broken version or a lower power version because uh, they just really want to keep all the radio signals quiet around there. It's pretty incredible. My minion Michaela got a really nice image of the Andromeda galaxy that weekend that we processed inside the Faraday cage. We had an, a very incredible lightning storm. And even when there's clouds, there's always something to image. So I always bring my camera with me everywhere. Uh, in this case, it was lightning. Sometimes I do time lapses of clouds. It's really cool to get pictures of clouds over the Milky Way when you have a partly cloudy night. And uh, yeah, there's always something to image. So this year I got to go to a star party I hadn't been to yet, which is the Okitech star party. This is another major star party that also had some 300 people at it. It's a 22 hour drive for me from here. And I um, uh, brought my new trailer with me, the one that you guys uh, got to see out at, out at Blue Canyon. It's all the way out in the very edge of the panhandle of Oklahoma in this very nice little dark spot over here uh, in the Black Mesa State Park area. Once again, packed up my car with the, uh, uh, I uh, yeah, packed all kinds of stuff into here and hitched up the trailer and took off for Oklahoma. Uh, this is the observing field. You can park your RV and then set up right next to it, set up right across the way from it. They kind of alternate uh, observing rows and uh, RV rows. Uh, just so everybody gets a nice sky view. You can climb up the mesas in the area and get a nice overlook of the star party and go meet the flamingos that are up on top of the rock here. And uh, I took a picture from up top, looking way down at my trailer, which is here, my itty bitty trailer in between uh, uh, Will Young, aka Deep Sky Dude's trailer, and another guy who I became friends with there. Uh, good to meet your neighbors. And there's my equipment set up right across the way. So I could just walk back and forth. And actually I was able to uh, remote into my computers from that distance uh, over my uh, my little Wi-Fi network that I set up. So that was nice. And yes, I brought four telescopes <laughs> to the Okitech Star Party because I'm crazy. And I did fit all of them into my car because again, I've gotten very good at Tetrising the back of that car. And yeah, even though they worked really great at home, whenever I get out to a star party, inevitably the exact same setup has a problem. So I used to spend the first two nights working out all the bugs. So I only bring this many rigs to star parties that are eight nights long, like Okitex, where I have a lot of nights to work out all the bugs. And yeah, ran all four mounts, all four rigs successfully by the end of the week and got some really nice images. I uh, yeah, more dining hall, more food. They have catering there, so you don't have to cook all your meals, but you can. You, a lot of people will cook on barbecues on their trailers uh, and stuff like that, or you can get the meal plan and get fed. I love, after I get my astronomy gear set up and running, my astrophotography images, I once it's all running, I go wander around the field and go look through everybody's telescopes. Now, a lot of people are very willing to share the views of their telescopes. This is a 30 inch F3 Dobsonian that was out there that I got to go look through, which was quite beautiful. And again, just get to bask in the light of the Milky Way. Uh, here's a night shot of, of all my equipment running and uh, a Wi-Fi mast because they had Wi-Fi on the field, which was nice. And yeah, just get to sit there and enjoy the night sky. Here is Deep Sky Dude looking through his Dobsonian. And yeah, had a had a great week. So what are some things that you should know about going to star parties? Red lights only. So as you might have seen on if you've been out to some of the uh, um, star party nights for the club, 
red LEDs are very helpful for maintaining night vision. And e even, even if they're red and if they're dim, you still want to minimize their use. And honestly, I find that it's easier to walk around by starlight than to have the very narrow kind of field of view of the light that the red light's emitting and turn the headlamps to the ground or put diffusive tape on them or just use a red flashlight because inevitably you'll be talking to somebody and be shining them in the face and then they lose their night vision even with the red the red light. So uh, yeah, be courteous with lights. Laser pointers are strictly not allowed at most of these star parties, uh, partly because of uh, you know the, uh, extra light in the sky, largely because of being nice to astrophotographers who are there. Um, so yeah, at a lot of outreach events, you'll use laser pointers, but at the star parties, they're generally not allowed to be nice to all the imagers. <laughs> uh, if you've ever been out uh, at at like a a star like a a weekend astronomy event up somewhere dark, inevitably somebody will open their car door, and with all these modern cars, every single light in the universe comes on when you open the door. And uh, a lot of times you can't disable those. Also take your key fobs out of your pocket because the number of times you lean over and then hit the panic button, I've seen it every single star party I've been to, this has happened. <laughs> so take your key fob out, please. Uh, for people who use laptops, a lot of imagers, you can cover the screen with red film or I use an app called Flux that makes the screen very dim and very red and makes it tolerable for me to look at and also doesn't bother my neighbors. And uh, I also have it inside of a little laptop tent so that the light doesn't spill out and bother my neighbors. And uh, if you have your RV or trailer or tent, use red LEDs inside of them or cover the windows so that your light stays inside. And uh, it's generally a good idea to tape over LEDs on equipment, especially when they're blue and green, which is sometimes the case. Uh, other things you should know is dress warm. Even in the summertime, it gets chilly at night, especially when you're running on very little sleep and your body temperature regulation is not working very well. Uh, usually it's a rule at star parties to not play music on speakers just to keep other people, but to not disturb other people. Uh, headphones are a good use if you want to listen to some cool spacey music or um, uh, classic rock or whatever you like to listen to. Uh, some uh, star parties will have rules about pets, whether you can have them at all, uh, whether, you know, they can be within so many feet of a telescope, gotta be on leashes, stuff like that. Follow those rules. Uh, consider sharing your telescope view with neighbors and passersby. A lot of people, sometimes people can get very focused on the observing list they're doing and that's okay, but it's really nice to, especially when you've got a nice big juicy daub, to share that view with people who are coming by to say, hey, come look at this dim galaxy you've probably never seen before. Or um, uh, sometimes I'll, they'll even ask like, hey, so what do you want to go look at? Especially when they've run out of targets. So it's really nice to get to look through other people's big juicy Dobsonians. And it helps the new folks learn and uh, get to see sights in the night sky they wouldn't have even known about. Do as much setup during the daytime hours as possible so that you're not trying to fumble around getting cameras attached or finding your eyepieces or uh, getting aligned and um, uh, or things that you can do before you do alignment as much as possible during daytime hours and bring snacks because you'll get hungry. So star party amenities vary pretty widely. As far as sleeping arrangements go, some have bunk houses like the Texas Star Party Green Bank, Oki Tex, potentially some others that I'm not aware of. A lot of people will bring out their RVs, travel trailers, campers. I've seen people camp in their cars. I've seen people camp in like um, storage trailers, uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and some have hotels or bed and breakfasts nearby. Oki Tex actually has a bed and breakfast about um, like two miles up the road. Uh, so if you if you want to go to a star party in comfort and style, then some of them you can stay at some hotels or B&Bs. As far as food goes, some have kitchens and catering. Some have food trucks. You can also cook on your own. Just don't have any outdoor flames after dark out. So like propane stoves and stuff, uh, again, for um, night vision protection. Most places are too far away from the nearest town to go out for dinner. And so don't plan on being able to go out for dinner, but usually they're close enough to a town to go resupply, get more ice, uh, get more breakfast food, whatever, get more coffee. Coffee is important. 
And specifically my advice for astrophotographers, assemble your whole rig top to bottom at home before you go. It doesn't have to be at night, just get the whole thing built from top to bottom so that you make sure that you bring all the tools and cables and adapters that you will need because you'll inevitably forget something if you don't. And I have a, an enormous toolbox. It's actually a, a, the biggest tackle box I could find on Amazon. And it's got uh, a bunch of spare adapters, batteries, nuts, bolts, every kind of screwdriver, uh, an extra headlamp in there. Uh, I've got um, like a air puffer in there for cleaning off filters. I've got optics cleaning equipment and some of uh, those like glasses cleaning wipes and stuff. Uh, yeah, so that so whenever I go out to the field with my gear, I bring the toolbox with me so that I always have not only what I need, but I very often also help other people when they're missing this adapter or they need a quarter 20 bolts or they forgot this hex wrench that they need. So uh, helpful to bring a, a toolkit. Keep copies of your program and driver install files locally. The number of times I've had to reinstall a driver or a piece of software because of malfunction while I'm out at a star party with no cell service has been uh, very frequently. So I keep offline versions of all my drivers and all my programs on the local machine. Sometimes I've had to spin up a backup computer. So I'll have those files will be saved on that computer or I can transfer them on a flash drive and get that computer spun up for backup emergency use when one computer is failing or having some kind of problem. And uh, don't try new gear or new software at star parties because inevitably you'll end up wasting more time on that and wasting your precious dark sky hours. The only new thing you should be doing is new targets. And uh, in case anybody's wondering what my 2024 eclipse plans are on this topic of travel. Uh, now, I, I currently live in Ohio. I will be moving to Albuquerque later this year. It would be fun to come back to Ohio for the eclipse to see all my friends, but I'm not going to. This is a chart of average cloud coverage in uh, on uh, April 8th of each year for the last, uh, I think, 10 or 20 years or so. And uh, as one might guess, this part of the United States is very cloudy very often. So you will find me in Uvalde, Texas, <laughs> where the uh, cloud coverage uh, forecast is much better. Um, it if, if logistics support, then Mexico is actually probably a better option in terms of cloud coverage and duration of the eclipse. But um, there's a whole other logistical challenge with going to um, a lot of parts of Mexico. So I'll be here near the Mexico border in, uh, in Texas. Uh, now, a lot of people say to not take pictures at your first solar eclipse or your second solar eclipse, early solar eclipses in general, just to bask in the moon's shadow, right? I can't not take pictures. I've been taking pictures since I bought my first film camera when I was eight years old. So I I very carefully write out a sequence. Uh, actually, I've used my DSLR the last couple of, of uh, the, the last, the, the two eclipses I've been to out of, um, for various logistical reasons. And also that's what I had at the time for the 2017 eclipse. Uh, in Backyard Nikon, I've got a very, very carefully planned sequence that I check the timing on over and over with this solar eclipse timer app on my phone so that I have the right exposures for capturing Bailey's beads and uh, uh, diamond ring and all the different brightnesses of the corona. And I, one minute before totality, I take off my solar filter and I hit go. And then I don't look at the computer the rest of the time and hope that everything works out. And so far, both of the eclipses I've been to, it has worked. I've gotten some really great pictures and uh, without me having to sit there and babysit it and I get to enjoy the eclipse while it's running. And yeah, I spent months rehearsing and honing the timing on these things. So I'll be doing that again for Texas, except I might bring two rigs this time. We'll see. I got to figure out exactly what I'm going to do. So these are the two eclipses I've been to. Uh, of course, the 2017 eclipse, I drove from Dayton to Casper, Wyoming, which is where the Astronomical League had their convention in conjunction with the eclipse, which was a fantastic idea on their part. And I brought an, uh, an Altaz mount, which is really great for doing daytime stuff. 
because you don't have to polar align it. I can plop it down. I can point at the sun and say, here's the sun. And it will track the sun uh, with some decent accuracy. Brought a little refractor telescope, my DSLR, and got some really great pictures. It just could not be better. And I, I don't I don't know if I'll ever get better pictures than that first one, actually. Um, and this is a composite image of 10 different exposure times to get the full dynamic range of the corona. In 2019, if you saw my talk on when I went to Chile, the last talk I gave for this club, I, I got to see a solar eclipse there as well in um, uh, July of 2019. And I brought down my DSLR, my Skywatcher Star Adventure. I polar aligned it using the compass and I'll, and uh, like um, uh, in the gyro on my phone <laughs> to get it close. And it was a little lower on the horizon. So the image isn't quite as sharp and the background is kind of high because it was only about 13 degrees, I think, during totality. And it's interesting to notice how much more ordered the corona was in 2019 during solar minimum than in 2017 when it was a little more active. And if you saw any pictures out of Australia from the solar eclipse last week, the corona is currently very chaotic and we're still, solar maximums not till 2025. So it's going to be incredible for the 2024 eclipse. That corona is going to be big and bright and very disordered and very cool. And yeah, so that's what I got. Uh, get out there and enjoy those dark skies, bask in the light of the Milky Way, and highly recommend hitting up as many star parties as you can, honestly. That's what I got. Awesome. So, uh, thank you 